All right. So where I left off, I've been talking about some additional wrinkles to Mendel's laws. And the example I've given was something called epistasis. And epistasis is where you have one gene affecting the effect that another gene has. Uh, sometimes you can have lots of genes that all affect the activity of lots of other genes. This can get really complicated. Uh, but the simple example I gave you was uh, coat color in cats. Uh, there are genes for the base coat color of cats. We talked about one gene with black, medium brown, and light brown alleles. And there are genes for white spotting. Uh, there's some other genes we haven't even talked about for white fur and for orange fur. Uh, orange fur, we're actually going to have to wait for till, till later. Uh, but there is also a gene uh, called the dilute gene with two alleles, dilute and dense. And dilute is recessive to dense. And if a cat is homozygous recessive for the dilute allele, then whatever base color the cat has is going to be lightened a few shades. It affects the way that uh, the pigment grains are distributed in each hair. Uh, so what you're looking at here is basically a black cat, but the black cat is also homozygous recessive for this dilute allele. So the black is lightened a notch and the cat looks gray. Uh, technically, this is called a blue cat, um, although to my eyes, it looks more gray than blue. Um, over on the right here, we've got a cat, um, that is genetically medium brown, uh, homozygous for that medium brown allele that we talked about earlier. But the cat is also homozygous recessive for the dilute allele. Uh, so the cat has a tan color. It's the medium brown color, but it's lightened up a notch. Uh, breeders refer to this color as lilac. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. They just call it that. Uh, but you can see it's a tan. Uh, the cat also looks royally PO'd about something. I'm not sure what. Uh, maybe because it can't have a cheeseburger. I don't know. The flip side of epistasis is pleiotropy. And in pleiotropy, you have a single gene having multiple effects on the phenotype. Remember that the phenotype is the physical traits that you have. Genotype are the genes that give you that phenotype. Uh, so this uh, breed of cats that you're seeing here is called a Devon Rex. And the Devon Rex allele is recessive to the non-Devon Rex allele. Uh, you may never have seen a Devon Rex cat before. Um, most cats are probably homozygous for the not Devon Rex allele. And um, we write Devon Rex as an R with a little E superscript. So here are some Devon Rex kittens and you can actually see they've got a very distinctive phenotype. Uh, if you're homozygous recessive for that Devon Rex allele, uh, first of all, the cat develops wavy fur, uh, kind of hard to uh, show this clearly in a photograph, but the, the hairs have a wavy texture uh, not the straight uh, texture that typical cat hair has. Um, and the face develops oddly. Uh, the face is unusually wide. Uh, the ears are really big. And the ears are kind of set low on the face, which means that Devon Rex cats look kind of like Yoda. Um, they're sometimes called pixie cats or fairy cats, because I guess they look like fairies or something. Uh, so they look, yeah, these kittens here kind of look like Yoda or may, maybe baby Yoda, Grogu or, or whatever. And that's just one allele. And that one allele happens to affect the texture of the fur and the shape of the face and the shape of the ears. 
That's pleiotropy for you. One gene has several different effects on phenotype. If you want a somewhat more poignant example of pleiotropy, uh, there's more than one way that you, that you can get a white cat, but there is an allele or there is a gene that has alleles that give you, give the cat completely white fur. And cats that are homozygous for one type of white fur allele not only develop white fur, they develop blue eyes, and they are usually deaf. Uh, something goes wrong with the way that their inner ear develops, and they're typically born uh, with congenital deafness. Although I'm not entirely sure how they tell because, you know, I, I think our cats at my house can hear perfectly well. They just ignore me most of the time. Uh, but these cats genuinely are deaf. And that's another example of pleiotropy. Um, pleiotropy is what you get when you have one gene that has multiple effects on phenotype. Uh, sometimes in completely or seemingly completely unrelated organs or, or features. Here's a dog example for you. Uh, this is, I think this is an Australian shepherd and uh, it's showing a coat pattern called Merle. Um, it's called Merle because it makes the dog look haggard. Uh, that was a joke. Um, I'm imagining you all laughing uproariously uh, right now. Uh, but this is a Merle dog. And in Merle, large patches of the base color are lightened, and you get this kind of spotted appearance. Uh, the same gene, by the way, is present in dachshunds. Uh, can I go back to the cat example? Just a minute. Uh, the same gene is present in dachshunds, but in dachshunds, they call it dapple. And merle happens to be dominant to non-merle. So the cat example I was giving was Devon Rex cats. This is a Devon Rex. Um, there's a gene that has two alleles. Basically, the dominant allele is not Devon, and the recessive allele is Devon. And if a cat has two copies of the recessive allele for the Devon Rex phenotype, the cat will develop wavy fur and a wide face and large low set ears. All three of those different effects on phenotype are caused by the actions of one gene, that's pleiotropy. Uh, so there's, some, there's the Devon Rex kittens again. And you can see the effects on uh, phenotype very clearly. They've got these wide faces, big low set ears, and wavy fur. Uh, so like somewhat more cuddly versions of Yoda. And then this is just another example of pleiotropy, cats that are homozygous for one uh, particular allele that gives them white fur also develop blue eyes and usually they're also deaf. So deafness, blue eyes, and white fur are all caused by the effects of one, one allele. If the cat's homozygous for that allele, the cat's going to show um, these different features in the phenotype. And there's your Merle example. Uh, Merle, again, is this patchy coat color. Merle is dominant to non-Merle, but here's the problem. If a dog is homozygous for the Merle allele, genotype, you could abbreviate that as big M, big M, not only do they lack pigment, but they're usually blind and or deaf. Um, and they have abnormalities in the way their eyes and ears develop. Uh, this poor dog you can see is blind and uh, is quite possibly deaf as well. This would be a double Merle uh, dog, one that's homozygous for that Merle allele. That's why if you're a uh, responsible breeder, you should never breed two Merles together 
uh, because a quarter of the offspring would be double merles. If you bred two merles uh, with the genotype big M, little m, then a quarter of your offspring would be big M, big M. They'd be homozygous for the merle allele. Half of them would be big M, little m, and they'd be merle. And a quarter of them would be little m, little m, and they would have a solid color coat. They would not look merle. Uh, but if you breed two merles together, a quarter of those offspring are going to be double merles, and they will be born uh, blind and deaf. So that's another case of pleiotropy, where a gene doesn't just affect the coat color, it affects development of the sense organs as well. I can give you an even more extreme example in Manx cats. Uh, this is a Manx. Um, Manx means it comes from the Isle of Man, which is a largish island located in between uh, the island of Britain and the island of Ireland. And Manx cats are born with no tails. Uh, they also tend to be born with somewhat longer hind legs than usual, so uh, they kind of look, uh, they tend to hop as they run. And it turns out that the lack of tails is due to one gene with two alleles. Tailless is dominant to tailed. The problem is that if you cross two tailless Manx cats, what you end up with is a ratio in the offspring of about two tailless cats to one tailed cat, which is not what you would expect. You're not getting that, that three to one ratio that you might think you would get. Uh, you're getting a two to one ratio. And the reason is that the genotype big T, big T, uh, if you're homozygous for that tailless allele, it's embryonic lethal. Uh, the embryo never develops properly. Uh, embryos that get two copies of the big T allele are never born. Uh, you never see them. They fail uh, very early in, uh, in development. And so a Manx cat has to be heterozygous, got to have big T, little t. And if you cross two Manx cats, you can work this out with a Punnett square yourself if, if you want to. If you crossbreed two heterozygous Manx cats, one of 25% uh, of the offspring get the genotype big T, big T, and those are never born uh, because again, this is an embryonic lethal. Um, and then two heterozygous cats, which are Manx, and one uh, little t, little t cat, uh, which has a tail. So that's how you can get that two to one ratio. It's because one quarter of the offspring, uh, when you cross two Manx cats, one quarter of those offspring aren't ever born. Uh, they never develop beyond the embryonic stage. And I assume their remains are some animals can reabsorb embryos that are not developing right. I don't know if cats can, uh, but whatever it is, they never develop, they don't get large, um, they just end up lost. So that's another wrinkle that can interfere with, um, uh, with simple Mendelian ratios. The last one I wanna talk about is genes don't exist in a vacuum. Genes effects on phenotype can get altered by the environment that the organism's in. Genes are not just floating out there in space, they are in a body. And what genes do can be affected by the environment that that body is in. A very simple example that I mentioned earlier would be human skin color there are at least nine genes with multiple alleles that affect the skin tone that you get. At the same time, your skin color is affected by the environment that you're in. Um, many people tend to get uh, tan if they 
spend a lot of time in the sun or in a tanning bed, or they tend to get pale if they don't. Um, and of course, people can vary in how well they tan. Some people tan really well. Some people just burn. Uh, that depends. So exactly how dark your skin happens to be depends largely on your genes, but there's an environmental effect on that as well. Uh, how much time you've spent exposed to bright light. Slightly more complicated example from kitty cats. There is a gene in cats for the production of color, any color. Uh, there's an allele of that gene that is completely recessive. It's called the albino allele. And a cat that is head homozygous for the albino allele does not develop any color whatsoever. And it will have white fur and pink eyes. Uh, you don't see full albino cats like this very often you need at least one copy of that color allele for a cat to show any coloring and pa or pattern. And that's epistasis, by the way. But there's an another allele of that gene, which is abbreviated lowercase c with a little superscript s. And that allele is fairly common. And if a cat has two copies of that allele, it will express Whatever, whatever its basic color is, those other genes that it's carrying that determines whether it's black or brown or what have you, will be expressed, but only on the parts of the cat that are cool. The parts of the cat that are warmer than average are not going to show any color. So the environment that the cat is in determines whether color gets put on, gets turned on if the cat is homozygous for this CS allele. And that's a great example of how the environment can affect gene expression. Now think about this. The parts of a cat that are cool are the parts that are farthest away from the core of the cat's body. So the parts of a cat that are cool tend to be the same parts as the parts of you that get cold the fastest uh, if you go outside lightly dressed on a cold day. Think about it, what gets cold the fastest? Your hands, your feet, your nose, and your ears, right? Those will, you'll feel the cold there a long time before you start feeling cold in, uh, you know, deep in your chest. It's the same thing for cats. Cats feel, uh, cats are coolest, right, on their face, their ears, their hands, and their feet, and also the tip of the tail. And this is how you get Siamese cats. Uh, on the left, you've got a cat that is homozygous for that CS allele. It must also have alleles for black color. So it's showing you black color, but it's only showing you on the colder parts of the body. And the cat on the left is what we would call a seal point Siamese. Uh, the cat on the right has the alleles for um, brown color, but it's only showing them on the cooler parts of its body. And we'd call this a cinnamon point uh, Siamese. Um, my parents used to have a cat uh, that was a gray tabby cat, but also was homozygous for the Siamese allele. So the cat had gray stripes only on its face and its ears and its tail and its legs. Uh, the central part of its body was this light cream color. And you can, uh, you can artificially affect this, by the way. I have never tried this, but I'm told that you can uh, shave a patch of hair on a Siamese cat's body and strap an ice pack to the shaved patch for a few days. And you'll end up with an extremely pissed off cat that will crap in your shoes. But you will also end up with a cat where the fur will actually grow back uh, dark in color if you artificially cool that patch of skin. Uh, you can do this, by the way, there's a breed of rabbits called Himalayans that actually have much the same thing. 
Uh, they will also develop dark pigment only on the cool parts of the bodies like the face and the ears. Uh, and I am told you can shave a patch of fur on a Himalayan rabbit and cool that patch of skin and the hair will grow back uh, darker in color. Okay, just checking the chat right here. Um, my wife, uh, when she was little, uh, their family had a Siamese cat that spent a lot of time outdoors. And according to her, the entire cat got darker when the weather was cold and lightened up in winter. Uh, so I haven't really gotten to observe that myself, uh, but I'm told that Siamese cats that spend a lot of time in cold weather will darken over all of the body and then lighten up in summer. Uh, Siamese cats that spend all of their time in nice warm rooms, you're not likely to see that. But that's a way in which the environment that an organism is in can affect the way that genes alter the phenotype. Uh, here's a complete non-cat example that you'll be able to see around here in about a month. These are hydrangea flowers, and I actually took this picture in uh, Kroger, I think, uh, a couple of years ago in spring. Hydrangeas are pretty popular garden plants around here. Uh, you'll see them in houses. You'll see them in gardens. My mom's got a bunch in her garden. And you can see that they, uh, they can vary between blue, pink, and white. Hydrangea plants will only make blue pigment when the soil is a little bit acidic when the soil is just a little bit acid. If you plant a hydrangea in alkaline soil, uh, less acid soil, they'll start growing pink flowers. And the ability to make any color is the result of genes, but the genes don't determine what color that is. You can quite literally make your hydrangeas change color uh, by altering the soil that they're in. I have been told that if your hydrangeas are growing pink and you want to see them more blue, you can acidify the soil by adding iron to it. So you can drive a couple of rusty nails into the soil around the roots, and this will actually cause your hydrangea plants to turn blue. Uh, I have not tried it myself, uh, but I am told that this will actually work. So think about this again, it's the genes of hydrangeas that make them able to make color. Uh, the white hydrangea plants don't have the genes for color production and those will stay white no matter what you plant them in. But the environment determines whether that color is going to be pink or blue. Uh, there's a fancy name for this, it's phenotypic plasticity. And it's something you'll be able to see any place that sells house plants and garden plants, uh, again, probably in about a month. Uh, these usually start showing up in, uh, in mid-March. Uh, keep, keep an eye out for them. You'll see them and you'll see them growing around town. Phenotypic plasticity. We'll look in lab uh, in a couple of weeks at the effects of single genes that have simple effects. There are a number of human diseases, for example, that follow these rules pretty clearly. Uh, what's a good example? Uh, sickle cell anemia, for example, is governed by a single gene that for our purposes has two alleles. If you're homozygous for the recessive allele, you have sickle cell anemia, if you're heterozygous, you don't have the disease, but you're a carrier and you can pass it on uh, to the next generation. Um, what are some other examples? Uh, several types of muscular dystrophy, uh, the disease cystic fibrosis, uh, the disease, um, not MS, I don't think, um, a disease called Tay-Sachs syndrome. Uh, there's a lot of human diseases that follow these rules of single genes with pretty obvious effects. The problem is, and what makes genetics more complicated with this, is that practically all genes do show some degree 
of epistasis and pleiotropy. Remember, epistasis is where one aspect of the phenotype is affected by several genes. Pleiotropy, one gene, has several different effects on phenotype. And practically all genes show some degree of epistasis and pleiotropy, and they're also influenced by the environment that the organism lives in. So in humans, for example, there is no single gene for intelligence. There is a genetic component to it in that smart people are likelier to have smart kids, but there is no single gene where, like if you're homozygous dominant, you're a complete brainiac, and if you're homozygous recessive, you're a complete dip, and if you're heterozygous, you're in between or something like that, no. Uh, intelligence doesn't work that way. There are hundreds of genes that have something to do with intelligence. There's no single one that makes you smart or not. And at the same time, intelligence is heavily influenced by environment. If you grow up with interesting and stimulating toys, you're going to grow up a lot more intelligent than if you grow up completely abandoned you know, in a, in a sterile room or, or some such like that. Uh, the same is true for height and weight. There's a genetic component to your height, but how tall you get also depends on things like your childhood nutrition. Um, as we mentioned, the precise skin color that you have results from at least nine genes, each of which has multiple alleles. So there's lots of epistasis there and also on how much time you've spent on the tanning bed. So this Mendel wasn't wrong, but the rules that he worked out were very useful, a very important stepping stone. They're not wrong, but we're now coming to realize that they are at best a useful simplification. When you look at an awful lot of traits, you find this sort of epistasis um, and you find other complications. And for a while, you got periodic announcements on the news that you know scientists have found the gene for schizophrenia or they found a gene linked to heart disease or something like that. You've got to be very careful with claims like that because the odds of whether you get schizophrenia or heart disease, et cetera, partly depends on the genes that you've got and partly depends on environment and isn't really due to having one single gene at all. You'd have lots of genes influencing uh, how your heart develops or you know, your state of mental health or things like that. So real world cases are often, they build on what Mendel discovered. He wasn't wrong, but the real world is often a lot more complicated than this. And that's kind of why I really wanted to include all of this stuff about kitty cats is that it leads me to be able to explain this, um, that genes are important, but they're ultimately not usually your destiny and they can interact in much more complicated ways than just the way they determine whether you've got purple flowers or white flowers on your pea plants. We ultimately have gone a bit beyond where Mendel left us, which is fine. That's the way science works. <sighs> okay, I tell you what, I have posted a sheet of practice problems on uh, Blackboard in the usual place. And I posted the answers with them. Uh, you don't have to do them if you don't want to, but if you can, you will be much better prepared for the second exam, <laughs> uh, which is coming up in, I think, just before fall break or spring break rather, I believe. <laughs> I'm going to post sometime today a second practice problem sheet that says somewhat more complex problems. And what I want to do in the time we've got left is show you one of these problems and then work it for you. And then this evening, I will post that sheet of practice problems 
and give you more material to work on as you study for the oncoming doom that is uh, the second exam in this course. So I'm going to switch the screen share over to this and try to uh, increase the size a little bit. Give us a little more room. And hopefully everybody can see that clearly. Okay, so this is a practice problem that you haven't seen yet because I haven't uploaded it, but it is the kind of thing that you're going to see on the, uh, uh, the second exam and on the final. And this is a problem about mice. When I give you these problems, by the way, remember, take the basic ideas from them. I talked a lot about cats in lecture, but I'm not gonna ask you questions about cats on the second exam or the final. Unless you want to become a cat breeder, you don't need to know that black is dominant to dark brown and light brown in cats. I mean, unless like your cat has kittens and you're curious as to why they look different, that can be interesting to look at. What I want you to be able to do is take these principles and apply them to cases that you haven't seen before. So here's a problem about mice. There's a gene found in mice that determines whether or not any pigment will be produced in fur. And the dominant allele, which we can write capital C, is dominant to the recessive allele, which we can write as lowercase c. Um, mice with no pigment in the fur are white. There's a second gene that determines how dark pigment is distributed in the hairs. Some mice will have agouti fur, and agouti means that the hairs have pigments at the tips and the bases, but no pigment in the middle. Um, and that gives the animal a kind of mottled appearance. I don't know how many of you have ever kept mice or rats, but if you have a tabby cat, look sometimes at the hairs on a tabby cat's uh, light stripes, and those hairs are agouti. Uh, tabbies have stripes of solid hair, solid color hairs, alternating with stripes of agouti hairs. Uh, so you can see what a gooty hairs looks like if you just look at a tabby cat closely um, or just let the cat shed on you, um, which they will do. So some mice have a gooty fur, which means that the coat looks this kind of mottled, uh, maybe sandy gray. Uh, that's called a gooty. And other mice have solid color fur where the pigment extends all through each hair shaft. And agouti is dominant to not agouti. Okay, in this case, first of all, two different genes interact to produce a phenotype. What do we call this gene-gene interaction? Uh, what we call it is epistasis. That's one where you either know or you don't. Okay, five, what are all the possible genotypes of an agouti mouse? I'm going to cut over to share the whiteboard right here. And uh, there's our board. I'll go ahead and make that a little bigger. So what are the genotypes of an agouti mouse? Well, let's go. Big C is the allele for, little c is the allele for no color. And let me see, agouti is dominant, I do believe. So the big A allele is agouti fur. And the little a is the allele for, for solid color uh, that isn't agouti. 
Okay, so what are all the possible phenotypes of an agouti mouse? You might be tempted to say that an agouti mouse can be either capital A, capital A, meaning it's uh, homozygous for that dominant allele, or capital A, lowercase a, which would mean it is uh, heterozygous uh, for that dominant allele, and agouti dominates over non-agouti. The problem is that you have to look at both uh, genes, and for a mouse to show any color in the fur and not be just pure white, you have to have at least one copy of that color allele. So an agouti mouse might have the genotype big C, big C, big A, big A. Big C, big C, little a, little a. Or big C, little c, big A, big A. Or big C, little c, big A, big A, little a. So there's four possible genotypes that an agouti mouse could have. It's got to have at least one copy of the dominant agouti allele uh, for it to show the agouti uh, uh, hair color pattern. But it's also got to have at least one copy of the color allele in order to show any color at all. And in answer to your question, no, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't really matter what, what order you write the letters in. You could write this big A, big A, big C, big C, and so on. Uh, that's pretty much up to you. Uh, checking the chat right here. Okay, nothing I need to respond to just yet. Okay, um, let's go back to that practice problem over here. If two white mice mate, can any of the offspring have a gooty fur? Why or why not? Uh, the reason is no, or the answer is no, they can't, because by definition, a white mouse has to be homozygous recessive for uh, uh, for the for the uh, uh, for the the no color allele. A white mouse must have the genotype little c, little c, something. And for a mouse to show a goody fur, it has to have at least one copy of that dominant color allele. But a white mouse doesn't have a copy of the color allele to pass on, because if it did, it wouldn't look white. So none of the offspring can have a goody fur. So the last part, let's say we crossbreed two mice, each of which has the genotype big C, little c, big A, little a. Predict the results of the cross. Let's go to the whiteboard. And okay, I'm gonna expand this and clear the whiteboard. And we are crossing two mice, both of which have the genotype big C, big little c, big A, little a, crossbred with big C, little c, big A, little a. Okay, so that sets up a four by four Punnett square. The first parent right here, the one with big C, little c, big A, little a, is able to pass on one of each pair of alleles. And there's only four possible ways that that mouse could do that. That mouse could pass on big C and big A, or big C, little a, or little C and big A, or little C and little a. Those are the only four possibilities. Okay, I want to see if I can make the font a little bit bigger, um, if I can figure out how. Uh, 
Okay, here we go. All right, that should be a little bigger. Okay, so one of the parents can only pass on those four possible combinations of alleles. Uh, one of the C's and one of the A's. Okay, they could either be both, both dominant, big C and big A, or one is recessive, big C, little A, little C, big A, or both are recessive, little C, little A. The other parent, it's the same thing, and we can write uh, the same combinations down the left side of the square that we're about to fill in. So the other parent can pass on um, those four possible combinations. All right, so we've got a, um, a square, and that's a four by four Punnett square. So if you give me a minute, I'll draw the lines and it should end up looking like that. Okay, to fill this in, all we have to do is um, take the letters and move them down the columns and to the right along the rows, sorting as we go. So what goes in this box is big C, big C, big A, big A. That represents one sixteenth of the possible offspring, or about 6.25%, that will inherit a copy of the color allele and the dominant color allele and a copy of the dominant agouti allele from each parent. And then over here we have big C, big C, big A, little a. And over here we have big C, big C, little c, big A, big A. And over here, yeah, nerds. We have big C, big C, little c, c, big A, little a. Okay, what do these represent? All of these genotypes that we've written so far correspond to mice that have at least one copy of the color allele. So their fur will have some color and at least one copy of the agouti allele. So all of these mice are going to look agouti. So the phenotypes for all four of these are um, agouti mice. They have uh, at least one copy of the dominant agouti allele. They've also got at least one copy of the color allele. So their fur is going to show color. Okay, now let's fill in the second row here. We have big C, big C, big A, little a. We have big C, big C, little a, little a. We have big C, little c, big a, little a. And we have big C, little c, little c, little a, little a. Okay, look at this. Two of these are going to be a goody. In fact, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna start, um, I'll tell you what. How's this gonna work? Okay. The ones that I'm highlighting here in blue are the ones that are going to look a goody. Okay, do you see why? They've all got at least one copy of the color allele and at least one copy of the agouti allele. 
But big C, big C, little a, little a, those mice have one copy, at least one copy of the color allele. So they're going to show color, but they have two copies of the um, agouti, of the non-agouti allele. So they are going to show a solid color. And I have just realized that we are almost out of time. So as quickly as I can, I'm going to fill in the rest of this. All right, if anybody's absolutely got to leave because you've got somewhere to be, go ahead and pick this up later, but um, I'll finish the uh, problem as quickly as I can. Your finished Punnett square should look like this. And let's see here. Uh, let me see. That one right there is going to be solid colored. All right, because it's got a copy of the color allele, but two copies of the not agouti allele. Uh, let me see here. Um, that one's going to look agouti. That one's going to look agouti. That one's going to look agouti. So we end up with nine agouti, or nine out of 16, that's 56.25% of our mice would look agouti. Three out of 16, or 18.75% of our mice would look solid color. They'll be black. And the last four right here have no uh, dominant color allele. So it doesn't matter whether they've got agouti alleles or not, they will not show any pigment, they'll be white. And we end up with ratios of nine to three to four. Nine out of 16 of our mice would be agouti, three out of 16 would be black, and four out of 16 or one quarter would be white because it doesn't matter if those four out of 16 are carrying agouti alleles or not. They can't show them if they don't have alleles that make it possible for them to have pigment in the first place. That's the way epistasis works, and it can set up some rather interesting problems that can be tricky until you figured out how to work them. On that note, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I'm sorry we went about two minutes over, um, and I'm stopping the recording now.